I invite you this evening to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. What has taken place here in Acts chapter 17 is that um, Paul, having been to Thessalonica and ministering in Berea, uh, has now come to Athens, Athens, Greece. And as he has come to Athens, Greece, he is waiting for uh, other disciples to join with him, ones who have been in other cities with him. Uh, as they are preparing to reach this city as they had reached others. God had different plans. Uh, God uh, wanted Paul to be there, uh, but God's plans are not always the same as our plans. And we have to learn to be flexible. We have to learn to be prepared to uh, do what God would have us to do, to talk with whom he would have us to talk with, and, uh, and to adjust our, our ministry, uh, our outlook, our witness, our testimony, uh, whatever we might be able to and be doing at the time. And so Paul is waiting. And as he's waiting, he uh, uses his time wisely. You know, in a sense, Paul is uh, here in, in you know, really the, one of the greatest cities uh, in the ancient world at that time. Uh, and uh, it was kind of probably like to him to what might be, be for you and I if, if we would go to New York City uh, and just notice all of the different museums or go to Paris or London and uh, just uh, one museum after another. Well, they didn't have museums in that sense, but they had all of these temples. They had all of these uh, other beautiful places that had been built. And, uh, of course, because of the climate and everything, things were very open. And uh, so he could have walked through the city, and that's what he was doing. He was just observing. He was observing the culture. He was observing the architecture. He was observing the people. And... Uh, he was a good observer. You know, we need to, uh, to know the people if, as much as possible that we're talking to and witnessing to. Uh, we can't always just start right in and say, bang, bang, here it is. Uh, here's the gospel, one, two, three, and out we go. Uh, and so he was, he was finding out a lot about the people. I'm sure that he had heard a lot about Athens. Uh, after all, uh, uh, wherever he had gone, and he was already in Greece and Macedonia, uh, he would have been hearing different ones talk about, oh, wait till you go to Athens. You think Corinth is something. You think Macedonia is something. You, wait till you go to Athens. And so he has the time, and, and he begins to walk around. And as he walks around, uh, he sees some very interesting things. And so he comes to this place, uh, and um, if you will, uh, go down with me to verse uh, 22, uh, Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 22. We're told there that uh, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, <clears throat> I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now, he doesn't say you're Christians. He doesn't say you're Jews. Uh, he says you're religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, 
nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in all the face of the earth, and has determined in their pre-appointed times the boundaries of their dwellings. You know, in all of our witnessing, we need to realize that those people who do not know the Lord basically break down into two categories. There are the religious people. Those are the people who think they know God, but they don't. And then there's the non-religious people. Those are people who don't know that they don't know God. Uh, so Paul, in his message to the Athenians, basically starts off by saying, uh, you have admitted that you don't know God. So let me introduce you to him. Now for most of us here, we probably will meet most people who are like that. Uh, the statistics, uh, the demographics of our area would indicate that the majority of the people here in our area are of the second class. They're non-religious. They don't know that they don't know God. And so we kind of need to know where we're starting from. And uh, so he very clearly uh, and wonderfully says to them, let me introduce you to God. Now, so far, we have learned, number one, in this passage, that God is creator. Notice, Paul says to them uh, in verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it. God is the creator. God has created all things. Not only that, but God is ruler. He goes on and says, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And so he tells them here that God not only is the creator, he is the ruler. Lord willing, this evening we're going to see two other things that uh, he shares with them. Uh, God is the giver and God is the controller. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, are truly thankful uh, for the ministry that you gave the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the good, uh, uh, the good example he gives us of getting to know the people of the place he was at so that he might minister to them and share with them the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, you'll help us. Now, many of us here have lived here for a very long time. And so we should know uh, what the folks are like around us. And we should approach them with that in mind. Uh, not uh, in an unkind way, but in a very loving and kind way, a very understanding way. Uh, knowing that uh, they may think they know God, but they don't know God and uh, don't know that they don't know God. Uh, I've, Lord, heard at times people say, well, I, I don't go to church, uh, I don't read the Bible, but I'm spiritual. Uh, that, that's a good indication. Heavenly Father, teach us tonight, though. Bless these truths to us. May we learn more about Thee May we be more appreciative of who thou truly are, what we must know about thee to better know thee, that we will not be ignorant of thee. We know, Lord, that we know thee personally as our God, as our Savior, but do we know so much more about thee? And I trust, Lord, that in the Sundays to come, in our own personal reading of the Word of God, we will get to know Thee better and better and better. 
Oh, may we know the depth of the heart of our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, number one, here, Paul says that God is a giver. In verse 25, he says, Nor is he worship with his hand, men's hands, though he need anything. He doesn't need anything. He gives to all life, breath, and all things. You know, Paul actually is knocking the props out of the Athenians' whole uh, system of idolatry. Uh, in effect, he's saying, God doesn't need you to perform all your little rituals, uh, all of your uh, little devotionals, all of your uh, things that you go through, uh, your routines. He doesn't need these, uh, you know, he doesn't need these statue things. He doesn't need these temples. He doesn't need any of this stuff. He needs none of that. He doesn't dwell within these things. Uh, you're coming to worship Him. Uh, you come and make your offerings to Him. Uh, and He doesn't need any of that stuff. That's not where He is. You're not going to meet Him there. Uh, understand that uh, they really believe that they were meeting their gods uh, when they came into those temples. And you can go all over the world and you're going to find people that way. Sad to say, there are, uh, there are within Christianity those who have that mentality, who have that thinking, who've been taught that. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, who, who will say, well, I, I had to go to church because I needed to pray. Well, that's a sad situation. Why should I have to go to church to pray? I can pray anywhere. Now, it's wonderful to go, uh, but you don't have to go to church to pray. But some people actually don't believe that they can pray anywhere but there. As if God couldn't hear them anywhere else. Wow, what would they do in a real emergency? What would they do in a real crisis? And so, he's saying, he doesn't need those things for you, but you need him. And why? Because, he says, because God gives to all life and breath and all things. Those are three very important things for us. Breath, obviously, talks about life. God gives us life. We know from Genesis in chapter 2 and that uh, the Bible says when God made man, he breathed into him the breath of life. Our lives, our breath, our everything we have comes from God. He has given it to us. Uh, we didn't just uh, happen, as the world wants to say. Uh, we came because God made us. And you know, that's really something to think about for a moment. God, in eternity past, <coughs> determined to make each of us. To make each of us individually. He, he didn't look and say, all right, well, I'll just make people. You know, he could have done that at the beginning, right? He could have done that. He could have, after all, he made plants and animals and all those things. Just He made them out there, though we know he, there was individual working of everything. But when it came to man, you go back and read Genesis 1. Read how he says that. When it comes to man, and by the way, he said, it is good at the end of each thing he created, it is good. And then the Bible says that he created man. He created man. One man. He then made one woman. And then he said, it is very good. So God gave life, created each one of us individually. But he also gives breath. That's, the breath speaks about his sustaining our lives. Every breath that you and I take 
is sustained by God. God is the one that makes it possible for us to live, for us to take in nourishment, for us to uh, be able to grow, for us to be able to function, for us to be able to do everything that we do. It is God who does that. And third of all, he says all things. Everything that comes to us, every good and perfect gift cometh from above. Everything that we have, every little teeny tiny thing to every big thing, whatever it might be, it all comes from God. We think of, well, I go to work and I earn money and so I go to the grocery store and I get the food. Or I pay my bills or I uh, rent my place or I uh, pay the bank on my place forever and ever or whatever it might be. But we need to always remember that God is the one who supplies every single thing that we have. And he knows what we need and he provides what we need when we need it. Not, not before, when we need it. Everything is of God. In Psalm 104, and verses 10, uh, Psalm 104, you can go, turn there if you want and follow along. We're going to start with verse 10. Psalm 104, beginning with verse 10 through verse 23. Notice as the psalmist speaks of the Lord. He says the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruits of your works. He's talking about God there. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he might bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are refuge for rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness and it is light, speaking of God, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lion roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you made to play therein. Listen, God didn't uh, wind up the clock of the earth and, and then step back and let it go. Let it run down. The tense of the verses here indicates that God is constantly at work. He is constantly meeting the needs of all of his creatures, all of his creation. Now, God not only supplies the, the water for vegetation, but for the food, for the birds, uh, for the animals. And then the plants and the animals are provided for, for God's food. He says that very clearly. God uses the cooperations of the, of the farmers and the herdsmen to provide this food. But ultimately, He is the giver. We have food. We got it from God. 
Every time we experience a prolonged drought, we're reminded afresh of our utter dependence upon the rain that God sends and His goodness, the rain and the snow. I must admit that uh, before coming here, uh, I, I always thought of the snow as knowing that it would snow because where we lived, you didn't have to be at a high elevation. Of course, here we're at a low elevation, low elevation. Some folks here in Marin actually live below the sea. Uh, I forget what our elevation was. <clears throat> we were thankful our house actually uh, was at a spot uh, in our town that if the dam down the river, up the river from us, ever broke, the water would come down. It would actually come into our town. It would flood but it would uh, it, it was so dissipate that just before our where the cross street is where we lived, the water would stop. It was always nights, and of course we had snow, and we had snow, and sometimes we would have snow. Now not like Pat used to have snow, and even like my wife used to have snow, but we had snow. But we always thought of snow as simply something that when it melted, it just went down into the ground and it helped our water table and, and it, you know, it helped everything that where we live. I never thought of it as we think of it here, that that snowpack is extremely, extremely important. Uh, it's not just the snow is up there and then it's just going to go down in the mountain, but that snow is coming off those mountains. It's coming into streams. It's coming into rivers. It's coming into reservoirs. It's coming into lakes. It is increasingly important. And so when we, when we go in through a drought and we go for months and months and sometimes years and almost see nothing, we should be so thankful to the Lord. We should remember that this is His grace. This is His mercy. This is His kindness. But you know, we also need to remember that biblically, God has a reason for droughts. When God dealt with Israel's sin, He often brought droughts. Now, I can't tell you that the last drought was specifically for the sins of our state or our area, but we shouldn't discount it. We shouldn't just dismiss it and say, well, that's just the way it is, because it could be true. And if that is so, And by the way, in Israel's history, God would bring droughts, but eventually he would bring the rains again. But if you go through his history, you'll see that the droughts became more and the rains became less as they continued to rebel against God. Now, I know the scientists will tell us this, that, and the other, and uh, they're trying to make predictions and they even plug it into the computer. But we have a Bible. And I think there's a very, very strong possibility that we're going to see a lot more droughts and a lot less rain in the years to come. You say, oh, pastor, you're depressing. Shame on you. You're supposed to uplift us. We're supposed to go out of here this evening and, and just be shouting for joy. Well, you can still shout for joy, folks. But understand, I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. But I try to be a realist. And being a realist, you base the truth of God's Word on what you see around you. And so, we don't know what will come. We know that there is that possibility. 
And then turning over to the New Testament in Romans in chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. When you get there, go down to verse 36. Romans 11, 36. Paul, writing about the Lord, says, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Paul is speaking here the providence and the sufficiency of God. God is the creator. God is the sustainer of the universe. He pursues his plans and purposes from age to age. No human rebellion can stop the ultimate fulfillment of God's will. His goals will be reached at last. God has a plan and God's plan will take place. And then in James in chapter 1 and verse 17, James 1:17. I kind of quoted this earlier. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is all-powerful. Creating lights is suggestive of holiness in contrast to darkness. God is changeless. God is trustworthy. He does not deceive. He is not two-faced. He is sincere. He is immutable. God is creator. God is ruler. God is giver. And fourth of all, God is controller. Turning back to Acts and chapter 17. Notice verse now 26. He says here, and he has made, that is God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their appointed, pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Number one, God controls the nations. Now, the Athenians believed that the world was made up of two kinds of people. Them and the barbarians. Everybody else was a barbarian. You understand what they're saying. That they were the only cultured people in the world. They were the only civilized people in the world. They were the only people who had any education, any knowledge, any wisdom. Everybody else to them was the scum of the earth. They thought of themselves as the international hotshots. They were the original super race. And what does Paul say to them? We're all from the same blood. We all come from Adam. You know, if we could get that in our heads, 
around this world, not just in this country. I understand the problems we have and I understand what's going on. But let me tell you, it's not just here in America. It's all over the world. If we could just get it through our heads that we are all one race, in reality, we all go back to Adam. I don't care uh, what our backgrounds are. In reality, we come from Adam. Paul showed them that God equally created and he controls all nations. No nation is better than any other nation. I know we love our country. I love our country. I appreciate our country greatly. But we're just one country. We're just one nation. We're actually not better than everybody else. We're not. And let me tell you, when you get a chance to travel around and visit other nations, and visit other places, uh, you'd be amazed. I, I like to watch the Discovery Channel. I like to discover things. I found out my son also is discovering things. Uh, he was watching something today, and we said to him, you know, what is that? And he explained it to us, and now we really are confused. <laughs> we have no idea what he was watching. <laughs> if I had watched it, I couldn't tell you the words that he was using. I'm like, whoa. I'm a little bit broader. He was really condensing it down. It's amazing, the people of this world, what they've done, what they do, their advancements, their civilizations. But God has placed each of them where he wants them. That's another thing, if we could just get that through our heads. The reason for wars and reasons and, and rumors of wars is that pe people want other places. They want other nations. They want other things. They want what somebody else has. We're never satisfied with what we have. We want what everybody else has. I mean, we're that way and we got everything, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, not only does God create nations, remember how he says that the king's heart is in his hand, he turns it any way he wants to? He also controls history. Paul says here, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. This means that God is controlling history and the destinies of men and nations. There was an American pastor by the name of A.T. Pearson. I had the joy last year of, of reading a fairly large book with sermons of his that he preached at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London after Spurgeon went home to be with the Lord, A.T. Pearson was called there and he preached there for two years. Marvelous, wonderful sermons. Just bless my heart. I had it next to my bed and I would read a section of it before I'd go to sleep. What a good way to go to sleep. I love what he used to say. History is his story. History is his story. God is in control. Now Paul goes on, he says here, determine their pre-appointed times. That refers to the seasons. That refers to winter and summer and spring and fall. 
as well as the historical times when certain named nations exist and then don't exist. When empires rise up and when empires fall. When nations are great and nations no longer are great. We should never get it in our minds that we're going to be an exception to history. Every, every great nation has risen and fallen. Every great nation. Do you know the average length of time that a nation is great? 200 years. You say, oh, what about Rome? <laughs> you look at the history of Rome. It may have lasted for 500 years, but it wasn't the Rome that it was. For 300 years, it was on the downgrade. It was on a slide. It was sliding into the Mediterranean. In fact, it left Rome completely. It went to Constantinople. It was gone. No one hung on, seemingly, but everybody else was passing it by. Nations rise, and nations fall. God has a plan, and he's working his plan. And then he says, in the boundaries of their dwellings, that refers to continental and imperial boundaries. God establishes kingdoms in specific locations. He controls the extent of their conquest. They can only go so far and then he stops it. We've seen this, well, not all of you, but some of us at least can look back and see that, see the, uh, in World War II, You go back into 40, 41, 42. No one believed that Hitler and Germany was not going to conquer all of Europe totally and take over a great deal of, of Russia. No one saw that. Well, Churchill said he ain't, <laughs> but he wasn't sure. For years, they struggled. But God said, you're going so far that you're going no further. You know, he said the same thing to Satan when he allowed Satan to deal with Job. He said, you're going so far, but you're no going further. God makes it clear that national distinctions, far from being a bad thing, are actually ordained of God. He has a purpose in it. He has a purpose in every nation being where it is. He has a purpose of each one of us being born where we're born. He has a purpose for each one of us living where we live. He has a purpose in all of it. Now, no, nowhere does he say you can't live somewhere else. He doesn't say that. In fact, if anything, it's God who spread us out lot. Remember, what did man want to do? Man wanted to stay all together. Here we are in this great city, Babylon. Babel. And, and we're going to build this, this temple that's going to reach to the heavens. And God came down and said, no, you're not. And I'm going to spread you all over this earth. And that was his plan. It was his desire. It's a good thing. Man's racial problems are because of man's sin. Man's lawless interference in the affairs of other people. So, 
God not only is the giver, but God is the controller. And history is on schedule, and God is running it. It's going to culminate with the coming of Jesus Christ, because God is in control. You know, when we think of God, and we should be thinking of God, we need to have an awe of His majesty, of His greatness. What's so amazing is that He lives in us, that we can actually know Him. I talked to uh, an individual I know, as you know, I walk and I run to different people. I don't try to run into them, but I run into people. What a language we have, right? How you doing, Pastor? I've been running into people. They're not all happy about it. But he was he was telling me how, you know, things are going so bad. And I, you know, I, I could have said, well, yeah, I, well, I listened to that, ch that channel, and yeah, oh, it's going bad, and oh, my goodness, oh, wow. I'd pull out my hair, but I'd mess it up so I don't do it. <laughs> but thank the Lord. The Lord said, you don't have to get into all of that. Why don't you be a witness? And so I said, you know, the Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us that things are going to get worse and worse. They're not going to get better. And then, crazy me, I said, have you read the Bible? And he said, yes, I've read it all the way through twice. I said, oh, wonderful. He said, years ago. I've never read it again. I said, you know, you need to read it again. Why don't you go to John? Read the Gospel of John. Notice the word believe and believeth. And then go back and start with Matthew and Mark and Luke. Now, he, he did mention, he said, well, is all those bad things in Revelation? I said, well, yeah, a lot of it. But you know, it's in other places too. It's in Daniel and it's in... Matthew's Gospel, and you know, it's in other places. Oh, you, you actually know if, if people have a little knowledge, that, that's, they think it's all in the book of Revelation. And you know how excited they are to read about Re Revelation? Ah, uh -uh. don't tell me. We're kind of like men. Some of us are actually really like men, too, by the way. Men have a tendency to not go to doctors. Not all of us, but some of us. And you know why we don't? Because we don't want to know that there's anything wrong. And we figure if we don't know that anything's wrong, there's nothing wrong. You know, am I hitting a, <laughs> and then there's nurses. Well, Pastor, you started all of this a while back by saying, how do we get to know God? How do we get to know God? If all you're going to do, Pastor, is just tell us about God, how do we know God? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and seen him. There's no knowledge apart from Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can introduce us 
to God. And through him, we not only know about God, we get to know God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we really want to praise you and thank you. What a wonderful thing it is to know that you are in control. This world that seems so chaotic, this world that seems to, to be on the brink of total destruction, that's because we're looking at it in the wrong way. We need to remember, constantly maybe remember, our God is in control. And then, Lord, we thank you that you are the giver. You have given us everything. You gave us life. You give us breath. You give us all things. And we praise you and thank you. Bless these precious truths to our hearts. May we meditate upon who God is as we come to know thee better and to come to know thee more intimately. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.